In class today, I made mention of the two things that almost derail European recovery from the Middle Ages and from feudalism. One was uh, the Black Plague, which all of you should be familiar with by now. And the other one is this, the Hundred Years' War. The Hundred Years' War is, uh, well, it's actually really a terrible name for it because, as you can see, it lasts for longer than a hundred years. I didn't name it. Don't blame me. But it is uh, a uh, an event that almost seems to derail our uh, recovery in Europe. The war is simply a uh, series of conflicts between France and England. The... Uh, the English king feels like he has a better claim on uh, the uh, the area in France than the French king does. Okay, so uh, the uh, the French king, the uh, who, and it's a, it's a really complicated thing, but essentially the English king believed. Uh, that he had a better claim to a lot of his territory than the French king did. And so England wants to increase their holdings in France. And so this is going to result in a war. A lot of these lands in France, whether it's Crecy up here or Bordeaux down here, have been under the influence of England for a long time. And so the... The uh, the French kings want the British out. The English want to get themselves into France, and uh, that's what's going to uh, to really lead to a war. This area right up here is Flanders. They were a major wool producing area. They kind of want to get out from under the control of the French, so they're actually going to kind of become loyal to to England, and uh, this is going what's going to prompt the war. I want you to understand that even though when we kind of get into this war, England by 1300 was a pretty united nation. In 1066, England had been invaded from a king down here in Normandy, William the Conqueror, who had moved his army up into England, conquered England, defeated the English king, and in 1066 had essentially united England under one king. And as a result, England has... Uh, become much more of a, a stable one monarch kingdom. If you look down here in France, you don't see that, okay? The French king controlled uh, some of these lands, not all of them, but some of these lands were still controlled by very powerful lords that were just technically pledged to the king of France. And remember, the British control some of these areas that you see in green. And so uh, the French king technically really only controls about half of France when the war breaks out. And so in some ways, the Hundred Years' War is going to be about France trying to unite as a kingdom. Now, the war itself, like I told you, is a series of conflicts. It's really, the war is kind of fallen in about three distinct stages. Uh, the first stage, the English do very well. The second stage is kind of a meh stage, kind of almost a tie. And in the third stage, the English look like they're going to win, only to be undone. So uh, it's a uh, it's a series of wars, though. So uh, there are, uh, and as you can kind of see, the war is a series of short raids and expeditions, punctuated by a few major battles, and that's about it. Okay, but technologically, the uh, this is a big deal. Okay. It's another sign that feudalism is over. Now, the French should have all the advantage here. Their population is high. They're richer. Uh, they have a bigger army. Okay, So all of these things make it look like the French are going to win this pretty easily. They're not. Okay, The British, in almost every engagement, are outnumbered. But weapons technology is going to allow them to... Uh, even the odds, okay? And uh, what the British tended to do is uh, quicker aids, avoid pitched battles, get in, steal what they can, make life miserable for the French, and then disappear somewhere else, okay? 
The, uh, the biggest thing, though, is that the English have democratized warfare. They have uh, allowed and developed technology that allows common, everyday people to participate in warfare, unlike the Middle Ages, where it was only knights that had the skills, the equipment, the armor, the ability to fight. That's not the case anymore. The English, for example, have developed one of the world's first truly revolutionary weapons, the longbow. The longbow is simply a, uh, a very powerful recurved bow that will uh, fire an arrow, and uh, the, it gives enough energy to uh, the arrow to penetrate armor. And so uh, they were stronger, really, than medieval crossbows. They were, I mean, lethal to, um, you know, 100 yards, 150 yards out. They could be fired in volleys, which meant that you have 20 or 30 people firing at the same time. You're bound to hit something. And so it was a, uh, a truly revolutionary piece of military technology. And uh, according to most statistics, it, we believe that English longbows in the 1300s could penetrate the armor of a knight at up to 200 yards. So knights had all of the advantage in close quarters. They have armor, they have, uh, they have the weapons ability, they have the skills to defeat, especially those people who don't have armor. But if I can get back away from you where you can't get to me with your sword or your horse, and I can kill you, that gives me the advantage. And that's what the longbow did for the English, okay? So uh, you could put more arrows downrange relatively accurately, and uh, that puts the knights in a very bad position. And some of these first real pitched battles, I know the English trying to avoid that, but you see battles at places like Poitiers and Crecy and others, and it's usually the English longbowmen, and you can see uh, them right there that tend to uh, be one of the major differences, okay? So early on, you have some major English victories at places like Calais, at Crecy, at Poitiers. But notice Poitiers is about 1356 or so, okay? You know from your own timeline that this is about the time that the Black Plague hits. And so the, the, the Hundred Years' War is actually interrupted by the outbreak of the plague, and the armies kind of go back home, and uh, we have to wait out the uh, the the play. You're also, I mean, we're right on the cusp, really, of uh, new technologies, and uh, you'll even see the beginnings of uh, of gunpowder. Now, it's not very effective yet, but it's going to be, and so you even see. Uh, some uh, effective use of cannon at places like Poitiers in 1356. The French really don't have a uh, a real... We're going to kind of just skip over this because I don't want you guys to know all that. But the uh, both sides really have some major problems. Okay, But in uh, the early 1400s, Grand King Henry V is going to... Uh, kind of renew uh, the attack on France. This is really the last phase of the war. The uh, English in, uh, have returned to France, led by Henry V, and at Agincourt, one of the, the great sort of British victories, okay, the, uh, the, the English managed to uh, really sort of uh, win a major battle, and... Uh, it looks like, at least for a time, that England is going to win this war. Notice, these areas in blue are uh, under English influence by 1429, okay? And so, uh, when you kind of look at that, you can realize that they now have significant French holdings here in the north, still have Bordeaux in the south here, and so what we would consider to be France seems to be shrinking, okay? The, uh, so you can kind of see what we're talking about here, okay? So at the height, this is really what the English sort of controlled. 
And uh, then out of nowhere, you're going to uh, get a, a French sort of revitalization, okay? The final stage, really, of the Hundred Years' War is uh, the one that is probably the most famous because of Joan of Arc. French king will uh, be visited by this young peasant girl named Joan who uh, believes that she has been receiving messages from God to take up the fight, to put on the armor and to go out and to uh, begin to fight the English. Okay? And uh, let's face it, the, 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 the French were losing... They, Charles doesn't really have anything to lose here. And so he says, sure, get out there, good luck. And, of course, he thinks in her first engagement she's going to get killed, and this will be a, a moot point. But through really what does seem to be divine intervention, Joan will uh, manage to begin to win uh, many victories. Okay, So uh, she uh, had... Uh, really kind of had a came from an area that had suffered under the English. These voices tell her to go and take up the weapons, Ed, to, uh, uh, to go and fight the English. And she does. And she starts to win major battles in places like Orléans and others. Okay, And so the French catch fire. And uh, under Joan's leadership, the uh, the French start to turn the tide of the war. And then Joan gets captured, okay? And uh, she's captured, uh, really, on an attack in Paris fall, and falls into English hands uh, because she was dressed like a man, because she claimed to have messages from God. She was convicted of heresy and burned to death. As a heretic. Now, the king probably could have tried to ransom her back to pay money to the British, exchange prisoners, do whatever to try to get her back. But Joan had become a, a major focal point, and the king didn't need another rival. And uh, so Joan is essentially burned to death as a heretic. And, of course, she instantly becomes a martyr. Excuse me. She uh, will, uh, of course, then uh, become a symbol, really, for the French army as they rally to eventually begin to push the British out of France. And, of course, Joan is always seen as uh, a, a major symbol and even today, we still see Joan of Arc used from time to time. Now, despite, like I said, Joan's capture, the French advance continues, and by 1450, the English had pretty much lost everything. And uh, by 1453, the war is essentially over. But you've had almost 100 years of warfare that even sort of spanned the Black Death. France and England aren't really on the cutting edge of things during this period because they are oh, excuse me they are fighting each other England for example being unified perhaps could have uh, done something really spectacular but instead spends a lot of its time and energy fighting in France and so uh, this is one of the things that will uh, hold up our medieval recovery maybe even postpone the renaissance a little bit but in the end, like that slide says right there, France is unified, and France does become a um, a unified nation as a result. And it's also another hint that feudalism in France is about to uh, to go away as well. All right, next lecture we'll talk about the uh, the Renaissance. The we'll finally get out of this mess. All right, so look forward to that one.